Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. And I wanted to talk with you a bit about paradigms. And this is a funny concept for a lot of people, and you may or may not be familiar with it. But the idea of a paradigm is, as I have listed up here, a bias or an angle through which we perceive the world. And the concept was developed by a fellow named Thomas Kuhn. And this is his book here, which you can see uh, in the reflection on the screen there. But it's called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. So Thomas Kuhn, and you can see down here where my pinky is, that the review says something along the lines of a, a landmark in intellectual history and its science. Um, the magazine devoted to science and uh, if you get high praise from that, then that is uh, an amazing achievement. So Kuhn's idea of a paradigm relates to how scientific revolutions are working. And the old idea of scientific revolutions, uh, science was once, I'm going to go down here for a second, science was once thought to be cumulative. In other words, the gradual progression of incrementally increasing knowledge that would lead to a giant understanding, a complete understanding of the world. Paradigms, though, focus on the idea that our understandings of the world, even through a scientific perspective, may be biased. Uh, they may come from a particular angle. And that is really uh, a key aspect of being human. We observe the world through a perspective. Right now, you're getting an incredible amount of information, even just from the screen, from watching me and looking at the slide. Uh, our minds have to work very hard to organize that information, to filter it out in order so that we can make quick sense of the world. So paradigms are, you could say, uh, intellectual ways of being that allow us to focus on some things and screen out others. And as an example here, I have the drawing that you have now in this little box. And I could ask you, what is it a drawing of? If you look at the drawing, uh, as you could maybe uh, horizontally, what do you see? Perhaps you see a duck. Perhaps this is the eye right there, and this is the bill of the duck right here, where the arrow I'm trying to draw is. Um, there we go. This is uh, the bill. If you were to turn this image, though, if you were to tilt your head, uh, looking at it vertically, you might see this is a mouth of a rabbit, and the eye maintains the same uh, positioning, uh, but these are the ears. It's very hard for us to see both the duck and the rabbit simultaneously. How we see the object depends in part on the principles that we're using to organize the information. That's a visual example, perhaps a visual metaphor, for how paradigms work. So paradigms within the social science uh, disciplines allow you to see uh, certain things. They allow you to ask certain kinds of questions and not others. Uh, they allow you to consider some elements of social life but perhaps not others. So there are ways of organizing information that I'll walk through with you, three dominant ways. And again, they're like filters for organizing and understanding information from a social science perspective, from a particular perspective in sociology. And so again, the previous idea that science is cumulative, that we're heading toward some capital T truth, in point of fact, Kuhn argued quite well that paradigms uh, indicate that this isn't the whole story. There are also uh, many other factors in terms of how we understand and organize the world and the information we have about it. The first of the three major paradigms within sociology is called positivism, or the positivist paradigm. And what I'd like to do with you for the next few slides is walk through four different elements in regards to each of the three paradigms I'm going to discuss. 
And those four elements are, first I'm going to go through, with each paradigm I'll go through, the nature of the social world, what the social world is thought to be, how that world ought to be studied, what's the goal of completing that study, and then what are the policy implications of this paradigm, and the way it studies the world, and what ought to be done with the information. Okay, So those four will be consistent through each of these paradigms I'll discuss. Positivism is, as I've written here, the idea that social laws could be determined as natural laws have been determined. So the idea here is that the social world can be studied using the same kind of methodology you would use to study the natural world. Um, observation and being able to see, count, and try to determine causal relationships which can then be explained. So if I were to be like say for example a um, geologist I would study rocks and I would try to understand them, uh, observe what they uh, do or, or maybe the principles of um, how they're formed. So in this instance you have like the law of gravity uh, positivists want to determine for example things like the law laws excuse me of society and the idea is, is that like gravity you could study the social world in terms of law-like regularities and that those law-like regularities like say for example the laws of gravity that you would have in the natural sciences the law-like regularities of the social world can be captured or understood by what's called the parallel ordering of abstract concepts. So if we can come to some agreement of an abstract concept like what is poverty, and we can define that and share that among all the different sociologists, perhaps we can try to find the truth, the capital T truth underlying poverty. We can study it in order to understand law-like regularities existing in the social world. In other words, is there some kind of basic law that underlies poverty and how poverty occurs? Wouldn't it be amazing if we could find that law, that law-like regularity? If we want to try to study the world in a positivist or naturalist way, then we're going to use the techniques of experiments and observation. Experiments are seen as the hallmark of the sciences. That's what you use in the hard sciences, like, uh, for example, in biology, in chemistry. Uh, you do experiments in order to figure out causal relationships and uh, to determine rationally why things are the way they are. Surveys for social scientists are also seen as a form of observation. Uh, so you can do surveys of people in order to understand the opinions, beliefs, attitudes that people have. And surveys are of course indirect, but they're thought by positivists to still have a lot of scientific rigor, um, much like experiments do. Again, you can figure out the basic underlying truth of what people think, how they behave, etc. What's the goal underlying the positivists approach. The goal is, as I like to say, they're playing for all the marbles. They want to explain and predict the world. So you want to get to the bottom of social life, how it's constituted, and uh, to be able to understand, well, if this group does this or thinks in this way, then this is going to be the outcome of that. So it's very much like the natural sciences, cause and effect type thinking. And as I say, explain and predict, those are the hallmarks really of the sciences. For example, the law of gravity. If I drop my pen over and over again, I come up with an idea that this smaller mass is attracted to the larger mass of the earth. I've come up with an explanation and I can predict what direction the pen will fall in the future. Wouldn't it be amazing if we as human beings could do that kind of explanation and prediction of other human beings and social groups. 
So that's what positivists want to do. The goal, explaining and predicting, relates to the policy implications. What are you doing positivist type research for? The goal is you want to improve society. You understand it in order for the accomplishments to better humanity. That you're using science to basically improve society. How can we make things better? Positivism connects very, very strongly with enlightenment ideas like reason and rationality, science, in order to have progress so that we might become better and understand ourselves better and humanity might improve. The second paradigm I'll discuss, the interpretive paradigm has very, very different assumptions and a very different orientation than positivism. Let's go through the assumptions. Here, the social world is believed to be meaningful. And that means that you have to understand it in context. The way I like to say this is that human beings are not rocks, right? A rock doesn't have any meaning you know, when it falls to earth. It's doing it because of some type of natural physical laws that exist, like the law of gravity. Humans, though, you can observe what they do, but you're not necessarily going to get out the meanings that they assign to their behavior, why they do what they do. That makes social science a whole different enterprise than studying, for example, things in the natural sciences. Because humans are a species that make meaning out of their worlds and they have subjective understanding of their world. So the world for humans is a product of shared subjective interpretations. So like for example, what does love mean to you? If love means a form of commitment, then that's one thing. If it means a form of passion, that's another. But those things underlie the actions and the way that we really make our lives. So interpretive sociologists believe you have to look at those things. And that's not going to be something that you'll ever necessarily get to the bottom of in a kind of a concrete way. Natural sciences think that we can get at the world and understand it in concrete form. Interpretive sociologists believe that we ought to consider the meaning of the world and behavior etc. So the idea, as I just articulated, I hope, is that the human world is qualitatively different than the natural world. And you can't just study human beings using positivist or natural style methods. So how should you study the world? Through the interpretations of the actions and behaviors of people in terms of the subjective meaning that they have for those social actors. So, perhaps as an example, um, maybe you had a, a favorite piece of music that you listened to and you had a particular meaning that you assigned to that. You felt really good when you heard that song. Now, maybe you were put in a situation where you heard that song where something terrible happened, like, oh, I hope this didn't happen to you, but imagine your best friend being killed while you heard that song. Suddenly that song, the subjective meaning you had for it, takes on a totally different kind of meaning for you. So sociologists who are interpretive want to understand the interpretations that people make of the world, their actions, their behaviors, even their beliefs, in terms of what's the meaning they're assigning to those actions and behaviors and, and things. So the, how do you do that? How do you understand the actions and behaviors in terms of their meanings? You go through naturalistic research methods. So you observe people and you engage in the groups that they're in. You see them as they act in the world, the real world. You can also do it through things like in-depth interviewing. Finding out the meanings that people give to their behaviors, 
beyond what you can observe. You also figure out things like the process that, for example, an object and its meaning can change over time. Think about something like a kiss. A kiss means one thing when you're eight years old. It might mean something very different when you're 20, and it might mean something very different again when you're 70 years old. So that meaning changes over time, and stuff like in-depth interviewing, and perhaps even things like life histories, can get at the process and perhaps different themes or um, ways of understanding over time. That leads to the goal. You want to do interpretive understanding. You want to understand the social world from, as I have here, the POV, the point of view of the people you're observing or talking with. You want to understand why they do what they do, not just what they do, but why. Why do you do that? What's the purpose of this kind of approach? To enhance cooperation and intergroup relations. So if we understand the meanings that we have, for example, the ideas behind a different religious orientation versus an, another orientation, um, that should allow for understanding to reduce conflict. If you at least understand why people do what they do, or the, the orientation that they have, that at least gives you some kind of a, an explanation and a reason so that groups might cooperate with each other better and there might be more harmony. The last of the three paradigms is the critical paradigm. And in some ways, you can think of the critical paradigm as a blend of the positivist and the interpretive paradigm. But it has also an element of action in order to change the world. There's this belief that you don't necessarily need to accept the world as it is. You can improve it by reducing conflict between groups and maybe oppression of one group by another. In this instance, the nature of the social world is a little bit, again, like positivism. That For, po for critical thinker, thinkers, the world, uh, social life, exhibits law-like regularities, but they're not from outside of people. They're made by humans, right? Rocks can't determine whether or not they want to follow gravity, right? They, they have to. That's how that situation is. Humans may exhibit law-like patterns, but they can change those. They're human-made historic patterns. So the idea here is that the social phenomenon we see all around us is cultural and not natural. And that has huge implications for humans to be able to change the world and improve the world. And the important thing is, unlike positivism, these are tendencies. They aren't laws. Again, they're possible or I should say there, um, it is possible to change those things. How should the social world be studied? There are several methods used by critical theorists, but the methods all have to capture patterns, and the patterns are going to have historical origins and development over time, as well as contradictory features. So, things like surveys can be very useful because you can look at the origins of a particular set of ideas, like, for example, the origins of capitalism, and uh, you could see maybe how capitalism is changing over time, what people think of capitalism. Um, it's also possible to use ethnographies, which are related to field work going into the field. The field is any place where humans are interacting and uh, writing about that. Ethno means people, graphy means writing, so ethnography is writing about a people. You can do content analysis, which is analysis of content, like for example in newspapers, magazines, television, to try to understand the general themes that are being promoted by those media. You could also do social history, for example, a history of labor movements, to 
to understand how they evolved over time, the ideas that they had at the beginning may be transforming or changing with a different historical context. Surveys uh, can be used as summaries of data too. Uh, again, the idea of process, you want to understand changes over time. Ethnographies, as I say, occur within a structural context. How do individuals understand their lives as part of a larger socio-historic period? Social history, as I mentioned, you're outlining the development of a certain group or social arrangement. And a key element differentiating the critical paradigm from the positivist is that you do not assume the facts speak for themselves. The way people behave is always within a context, a cultural, social, historic context that you must incorporate. And positivism does not necessarily have that same set of assumptions or ideas. Those in the critical paradigm have a particular goal in mind with their research. They want to produce conscious awareness among people and groups of the patterns governing their lives. You are part of different groups and you are also of course an individual. You have certain ways of thinking and you may not be aware of the way that you as a human being are creating those things in relation to the context and the era in which you live. So the idea for critical thinkers is to help people to understand that things work differently than how you might think they work. This is a, a kind of a curious thing, but critical theorists believe that there might be a truer understanding of social relationships that people are not aware of. They're not aware, for example, of how sometimes people do things against their own interests. One example might be, why do women wear high-heeled shoes? Some people might say, well, I want, if I'm a woman, I want to look attractive, I want to be feminine, this is a part of femininity, I don't want to be rejected, some of these things. A critical theorist might say, well, this might be part of a larger pattern of patriarchal oppression of women. High-heeled shoes hurt. High-heeled shoes, you could say, debilitate women and make them have a great difficulty running. Um, so why is it that certain kinds of femininity are seen as the forms and not others? Uh, how did this come about? And does this work in the interests of women? Or is it something that oppresses women, keeps them in a state of denial about how they are oppressed within a certain socio-historic context. And that leads into the final part, the policy implications of the critical paradigm. You want to raise consciousness of people. So you would want to raise the consciousness of the working class, how they're being oppressed by the owners of the means of production. You might want to raise consciousness among women about their oppression by patriarchal structures. You might want to raise consciousness of minority racial groups about patterns of oppression and ways of thinking that may have caused them to accept oppression when they don't need to. So this idea of raising consciousness is about creating self-conscious change that helps resolve or reduce inequalities promoted by contradictions in social relationships. Marxist theories are really a basis for the critical paradigm because they're all about critiquing capitalism and the oppression of one group by another group. Feminist theories are also, as I've said, critiques of patriarchy. Again, the oppression of one group by another group. How does the group that's in power create the conditions whereby the people underneath them accept their powerlessness or their reduced power? And how can this group become more aware to change that environment, to change that situation, and create equality for all. So, to conclude, we went through three different paradigms that are key in sociology in terms of organizing and understanding information. They allow you to answer, to ask, I should say, some questions and answer them in certain ways. And 
that's important because not all sociologists agree on, for example, the assumptions about the social world, uh, how the social world should be studied, what's the goal of doing sociology or social science, and what are the policy implications of all of those different things in terms of action. So I wanted to give you a good overview of those paradigms and that will allow us to discuss how different social theorists fall under the general logic of each of those three paradigms.